Um, and this is the woman who wrote the Pokey Little Puppy. Um, and her name was Jeanette Lowry, and she was from San Antonio, Texas. <clears throat> and she was really a novelist, and um, she wanted, um, I think more than anything, to write a kind of saga uh, for older girls um, set in Texas, a historical saga, um, somewhat akin to what Laura Ingalls Wilder had done for another part of the country. Um, but life uh, intruded, and she never um, got to write that series of books. But as a lark, um, and to make a little pocket money, uh, and on the suggestion of an editor friend of hers from New York, she wrote um, a light story about some puppies getting into a bit of mischief, and that turned out to be the most popular uh, picture book ever written, uh, The Pokey Little Puppy. Um, now here are two more people from the animation world. They were friends of Gustav Tengren's, and he was the one who encouraged them to come east. And their names are um, Alice and Martin Provinson. Um, Martin Provinson uh, worked in the story department at the Disney studio. The story department had a special aura around it. They were like the, um, um, they were the ones who um, came up with the ideas that um, everything else was based on. They were considered the kind of geniuses of the place. Um, but he, he didn't get along with Disney very well. And Alice uh, worked down the street at the Walter Land studio where they were making Woody Woodpecker uh, cartoons. Uh, the two of them were both from Chicago. Um, they didn't meet each other until they got to California, but when they compared their life stories, it, they concluded they, that they probably sat across from each other at the local library you know, throughout their childhoods. They had so much in common. <clears throat> and um, as their career evolved, and they came east um, in the, the mid-1940s, right after the end of the war, um, and they began doing books together, they came up with a pretty unusual way of working. Usually, one member of the collaboration team is the illustrator, the other is the writer, or at least they take turns doing one or the other. Um, in their case, um, it was totally seamless. Um, they would sometimes work on the same picture. And you could never, t no one will ever know who did what. And they would, she, Alice, who's still alive, will never tell you. <laughs> so, but she did say that, um, she said we were, um, Ours was a true collaboration. We were one artist. She said that to me uh, when I interviewed her once. Um, and they did wonderful work. Um, this was um, one of the first two little golden books that they did together. We have original art in the show here from both of their first two books. The other one is the story of Noah, uh, Noah and his ark. Um, <clears throat> and this was a book that was written by the author of Goodnight Moon, Margaret Weiss Brown. And the sort of educational side of it is that it teaches children about mixing primary colors to make secondary colors. But it doesn't do that in a teachy kind of way. Um, it tells a, a story about some mischievous kittens who knock over pots of paint and the paints start to mix together and then you see what the result is. Um, so they managed to get a lot of information in without making you realize you were learning something. And this is their uh, Book Week poster from the 1950s. And this is a book they did in 1960, um, which was a more traditional picture book format, though it was published by Golden Books. Golden Books was getting tired of not getting um, recognition from the people who gave out prizes. Um, one reason that they didn't get it was that um, their books were not you know, quite as sturdy as um, traditional traditionally bound books were. So libraries didn't sometimes buy them for that reason. But another reason was that um, because they were inexpensive, people were just suspicious of them. They thought, how could something that cheap also be that good? Um, so they never really got a fair shake from the critics. Um, so this was an attempt to dress up a golden book in, in, and reach for the brass ring. But they didn't get the prize this time either. Um, and finally, the Provinsons did win the award, but it was when they began publishing with Viking, which was one of the traditional houses. Um, and this came to them in the early 1990s, um, years and years after they you know, probably deserved to get it. Um, um, and this is Lucy Mitchell, and she was one of, another one of the experts, like Mary Reed, who became involved with Golden Books, also in an effort to assure 
everyone that golden books really were valuable and worthwhile for children. And she was the founder of the Bank Street College of Education, uh, which is in New York, still there. And um, she was very, very interested in how children um, begin to use language right from the time when they're gurgling and making sounds as babies and toddlers, then on up through the first several years of their lives. And being a very um, methodical person, um, that curiosity and the research that came out of it um, led her to begin to think about what were the best kinds of stories for children at each of those ages. What actually would be most pleasing to them, would be most beneficial to them at each stage as their own language abilities um, developed. Um, and so um, she um, then took the next step and tried to create a series of model stories for children based on her thinking and her observations of children in the nursery school that she herself ran at Bank Street. And so the Here and Now storybook came along in the 1920s. One of her conclusions had been that whereas um, in the libraries the tradition was to focus on what might be called once upon a time tales, uh, fairy tales and things of that kind at story hour, to take children out of their ordinary lives and give them a sense of fantasy, which of course is a nice and valid idea. But her idea was that um, contemporary children live in cities and they're also deeply curious about the world that they know. So she thought it might be interesting to offer young children stories about the modern world of um, cities and trains and trucks and things like that. Um, this is what the inside of that book looked like. And she began encouraging some of her teacher trainees to write for children too, to experiment. And um, the star among all of her teacher trainees turned out to be someone who was very good at that, and that was Margaret Weiss Brown, who um, within just a few years of meeting Lucy Mitchell, uh, wrote The Runaway Bunny and then uh, Good Night Moon and actually a hundred other picture books. Uh, this is one of the golden books that Lucy Mitchell herself wrote. And she thought golden books were wonderful because they were reaching so many children. And she was all about not just having good ideas, but implementing them in the real world. So she thought if this publisher could reach hundreds of thousands of households, what could be better than that? Um, so this was one of the books that she herself wrote. And Tibor Gurgley, uh, the fellow who liked to illustrate uh, working people, uh, was the artist for this book. There you see it from the inside. Scenes of modern urban life. Um, and this is another book that Lucy Mitchell wrote for Golden Books, and it was all about how food gets to the table. Um, and it was all really all about um, helping children to think, to understand the processes of their everyday life, rather than to just memorize lists of facts, the way traditional school often encouraged kids to learn. Um, progressive education was about what they called relationship thinking. So, um, you know, what does that cow out in the field have to do with the glass of milk on my table? A book like this was meant to, to follow that chain in a way that a young child could understand and enjoy hearing about it. Um, and here was Margaret Weiss Brown looking very glamorous, actually posing for Life magazine in this picture, um, writing with a feather pen, trying to scandalize the library world, I think. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's writing in bed, um, looking a lot like a movie star. Um, and she was, um, became the star uh, writer for Golden Books in the 1940s. Um, and uh, close behind was the wife of the man who illustrated Goodnight Moon. This is Edith Hurd. Um, she was also a Bank Street student, one of Lucy Mitchell's protégés. And she um, wrote about 75 children's books on her own, but she also collaborated with Margaret Weiss Brown on a number of little golden books, including this one, um, which is another one of these books which is telling children how the real world works. What happens when you mail a letter and how does it get to the person at the other end? Um, again, um, Tibor Gurkley was the illustrator. And there you see this um, really beautiful you know, picture of a boy sitting down to write a letter to, lying down to write his letter, write a letter to his grandmother, and there he is mailing it. And page by page, the letter makes its way across the United States by all sorts of means of transportation with the help of dozens of people. And who knew that it was so complicated and interesting as that? And this is um, Garth Williams, who you know as the illustrator of the Little House books and 
also Charlotte's Web and Stuart Little and other things. We have a bunch of things by him in the exhibition. He was a sculptor to begin with, and um, his parents were English, and he grew up um, in London for the most part. Um, and when you look at his characters, I think you'll see that you can see the sculpture in him because they're so rounded. They feel like they're almost stepping out of the page. Um, and uh, he was very prolific, and his father had been an illustrator too, so he had quite an interesting background. And he came back to New York just as the Blitz was starting. He'd been injured um, uh, during the bombing, and so he decided to come to New York. Um, and E.B. White um, and his wife, Catherine, who was the fiction editor of The New Yorker, saw some of his drawings, and that's how he came to illustrate Stuart Little. Um, but the thing about um, Golden Books for him was that he could work in full color, whereas all those other books of his that I've mentioned were in black and white, and that was because printing in color for most publishers was way too expensive. But Golden Books had those big printing presses in Racine, and print color printing was what they did. So, so it gave him a big opportunity, and he you know, went for it. And this is one of the books that he did. He did a lot of things with Margaret Weiss Brown, and this is from a book called Mr. Dog, um, or The Dog Who Belonged to Himself. It's a book about self-possession. A little boy who belongs to himself meets a dog who belongs to himself, and so they decide they can be friends because they're on the same level. Um, so it's, it's really a beautiful, clever way of talking about a, you know, a basic um, concept. I don't think you could get away with having a dog smoke a pipe these days, but, uh, <laughs> but that was then. And then um, this was another book that he did with Margaret Weiss Brown, The Sailor Dog, and here you're seeing it in one of the Scandinavian editions because Golden Books spread into Europe um, right after World War II and even to Japan uh, by 1950. So it was becoming a worldwide phenomenon. And Leonard Weisgard was another American-born illustrator who did over 200 books during his career. Um, he was so um, eager to get his career started, just as Marie Sendak was in The Next Generation, that he, um, he didn't bother to go to art school. He just um, started working. And where he started working was The New Yorker. Um, this he did, I think, when he was 18 or 19 years old. Um, he was also doing fashion illustration like this. Um, and then uh, he was very much in demand, and Margaret Weiss Brown met him at a party and got him to do children's books. And pretty soon um, he was doing books on his own, including this little golden book, which is about a French poodle who wants to be a French chef. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good idea. Um, now this is um, Margaret Weiss Brown's summer house on an island off the coast of Maine. She called it the only house, even though there were 1,600 other people living on the island with her. <laughs> she, that's kind of what, what she was like. She was very self-dramatizing and could be a lot of fun to be around, but also could be difficult, apparently. Um, she wanted Leonard Weisgard to come up there with, with her to work on a book, and he had really terrible hay fever, so he was reluctant to do it. Also, if you remember that picture of him, he was wearing a tie even when he was painting. So you could say that he was really a city person. Um, but she said, no, you have to come. And so he finally agreed. And he said, here's what we're going to do. Um, you're going to stay in the house so you won't have to sneeze. And I'm going to come up to the window with armloads of flowers and things for you to paint. And then when you've done that, I will feed you. <laughs> so, so the result was the Golden Egg Book, <laughs> which is a very, very large format Golden Book. Um, it's, a, it's a perennial favorite at Easter time because it's a story about bunnies and eggs. Um, but it's also about a lot more um, because they wanted to put um, a lot of the beauty of nature into this book for children living in the city who might not ever get to go to the countryside. That was their motive for doing this book. And you can see, it almost looks like medieval illumination. It's so exquisitely painted, um, especially if you could see it printed in the original large format. 